Ah, excellent. An engineer. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Professor, a lot for the presentation. We heard your schedule here in France has been quite busy, so thank you a lot for being here with us today, uh, discussing such an important topic. Um, so today, Joaquin, Mathieu, and I are going to uh, criticize the paper of 2018, have some comments and uh, contextualization. So first, we're just going to context uh, and give some main contributions of the paper, uh, then have some comments about the model, uh, discussing with you, and then we're going to bring a broader discussion on the role of modeling to push for uh, these agendas on, on climate. Okay, so just some uh, context and then contributions of the paper of 2018 that we, we read for today. Uh, so as Professor has already said, uh, by applying a non-linearity to this model, he is able to simulate different global warming planetary scenarios, combining a stock flow consistent uh, integrated assessment model with a cyclical Minsk and financial dynamics. So a lot of complicated words, but I think what's important to take out of uh, here is that the integrated assessment model allows us to at, at the same time look at the effects of the economy on climate and on the effects of climate on the economy. So this feedback loop and at the same time aggregating the financial stability side of it with the, with the Minskian um, literature. Of course, it, it, it uh, builds on all this literature and the paper has three main findings. So the first one that the, uh, the target put by the Paris Agreement of uh, only an increase of two uh, degrees Celsius to global temperature is already out of reach unless we have technology able to take out CO2 of the atmosphere. Um, also that we are going to have a severe unplanned degrowth, I like that you use this term, um, which is basically a great recession uh, with a lot of un unemployment with, if we don't have any policy interventions. Uh, but a more positive uh, contribution or finding is that we can have a, a target of 2.5 degrees Celsius if we have an uh, adequate carbon price trajectory and that higher wages, shares, employment and lower private debt would contribute for this trajectory. The paper has also um, inspired a lot of literature on stock flow consistent models of global warming and financial stability. Okay, so here we propose a little dynamics where we're going to pose uh, some questions on, on the model uh, to you and then we give you two, three minutes to comment quickly and then we, we pass to the next question. Uh, we're going to try to do it quickly. Yeah, the first critique is about the damage function. You mentioned that the Nautilus damage function was so stupid, like six degree bring us to 10% damage on the GDP. So there's a huge criticism about this. And there's Stern, there's also Daphermos who try to have more conve convex da damage function. And you use uh, this one, but still, where does it come from? There's no empirical evidence on this function damage because in engineering school, for instance, we, we're going to study longevity of bridge by using fun, uh, damage function based on empirical evidence. Here, the main uh, d dynamic we have in the model is the retroactive feedback loop of climate on GDP. And where does this function come from? Also, as Daphimus uh, um, advises to say, like we, we have to think about capital damage also, which is not done by Nordos. And for the capital damage, you only use like one third of the damage on capital. Why, why one third and not on uh, another thing? Yeah, and one another thing that called attention to us when uh, modeling the climate damage is how sensible the results were to the equilibrium climate sensitivity calibration. So, as ev so, so everyone understands it. The climate sensitivity is how much the climate is affected by output growth, uh, by the emissions of, of CO2 and greenhouse gases. So the, the targets we just talked about, um, they depend on these specifications. So the results basically are saying that um, they, they are valid if the climate uh, sensitivity is between 3 and 3.1 uh, degrees Celsius. And then we look at the calibration and it comes from the paper of Nordhaus 2016. And in this paper, he does an interesting debate on the certainty of these parameters and how this has a, a distribution of probability. Um, and in, this, in the distribution, the mean is 3.1, as used in the paper, but it also has a standard deviation of 0 0.8 degrees, uh, which means that in, in a long part of the distribution, this would not be met. So we would like to uh, ask you, so how dependent the results are uh, to this parameter and what's the importance of this parameter also in terms of policy, so if this could be changed, for example, for uh, if for better uh, technological improvements. For the damage function, I, I definitely agree with you. 
the point of the exercise was to say, even if we take the damage function used by no doubts, for instance, then we may reach very bad conclusions. And then in the paper, we have used other damage functions, one by Weizmann, the other one by Dietz and Stern, which are much more pessimistic or m maybe much more realistic, I believe. And we have seen that the conclusions are also even worse. So, so I also have published a paper with uh, Marie-Noël Wallet from IFD criticizing these damage functions. We should work on an alternative because it's easy to criticize. The question is, what is the alternative to that? Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you, for the time being, there is no such thing as a credible alternative to these damage functions. So as unsatisfactory as it might be, for the time being, we have nothing else to do at, uh, at our disposal. In the last paper that we're going to publish very soon, what we have so shown is that actually the damage function itself does no longer matter in the sense that we are in such a bad situation that even with the most optimistic one, by no doubt, we reach out conclusions which are very, very bad. So, so the, use of the, the, the need of the capital is clear, so we have introduced some dependence with the capital. Why one third? I completely agree this is, uh, this is largely arbitrary. But we would need a huge investi empirical investigation to go further than that. And nobody has gone further than that. Dafermos has done nothing in this. Mm -hmm. uh, sensitivity. So the equilibrium, the, the climate sensi equilibrium sensitivity, is, you know, is the, the global warming that would result from a doubling of the concentration of CO2 today after the atmosphere would have reached a new thermodynamic equilibrium in two or three centuries. Nobody can observe it. Physicists can only say this is the probability distribution of this climate sensitivity parameter was earlier 2.9 degrees Celsius and which now unfortunately is 3.1. So there is, so we cannot do, more, nobody can do more than that. There is no way to observe the climate sensitivity. We cannot wait just three centuries to see the output or the outcome of a doubling of the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. So all we can do, which is the right question that you, you uh, raise, which is to study the sensitivity of the results of the model with respect to the climate sensitivity. But nobody can do better than that. Okay? Yeah, yeah also you claim, and also King, you claim that uh, this, is, this modeling is post Keynesian, but there's some embarrassing facts about this model which led us to think it's not that post Keynesian that we can think. First, it's a supply led model, there's no room for demand in this, this typical model, and um, uh, the growth is mainly led by worker productivity. There's also the investment function, which is profit-led, which is like something like this, like a share of output, uh, profit-led. Why don't you use the, didn't you use um, the Neocalyscan investment function, for instance, uh, with uh, capacity util utilization? Also, uh, about the King's DAP. So basically, uh, the, the, the investment is paid uh, by profit, and if it's necessary, the debt, uh, uh, there's debt uh, give, given by the banking sector. So we have the investment, which is this. And um, from that, there's an extension to money creation. The claim that there's money creation and, and there's just money. Uh, so you use the Graziani, Graziani's uh, circuit theory, and uh, there's a double entry bookkeeping for the transaction between agent, uh, Keen highlight the role of bank and debt uh, uh, and money creation in order to have a debt de crisis and a recession and a stability. But it's not so clear in the model because if we use, for instance, the labor work on initial and final finance, if we, uh, like, just to, to say if you don't remember, initial finance is bank deposit needed to make transaction and final finance is savings as defined uh, by the national account. But when we read the paper, and also the, the from Keen, we have the feeling that new debt represents initial finance. But uh, the new debt uh, is money created by banks, in an, uh, like, like as if uh, the money created by banks uh, was indigenous response to firm uh, uh, desire to invest. But it's not compati compatible with the Keen model equation for two main reasons. First, the initial finance is not bounded, but it is in the model. In reality, if banks print more money, uh, the value, uh, uh, than the value of output, we're going to have a price increase, but uh, there's no such mechanism in, go in the goodwin key model. And the second thing is, like in the income approach, okay. in the income, oh, wow. marker. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the, the whiteboard. 
in the income, income approach, we have this. So profit, wage, and uh, uh, just on that. In the expenditure approach, we have this. Output is consumption and investment. And in the, the new debt, it do, that is the difference between the needed investment and profit in the model. Mm -hmm. So if we combine all of this, we get this equation with very simple mathematic passages. <laughs> <laughs> this. So guess what, what we can understand from this? New debt appears as the part of household and bankers' revenue that is not consumed, consumed but saved. So it's final finance. It's not. It's not. Uh, it's not initial finance. But there is like controversy between what we claim in the paper and what is behind the paper. And then there is also a claim made by Potier uh, about the fact that in this model, it's more related to vulnerable funds theory than the the money creation theory. And I want you to, to answer about that. I essentially agree with everything. <laughs> <laughs> so meanwhile, we have rewritten the model in such a way that there are inventories and the model is demand-led. Uh, the investment function can be, has been rewritten. I definitely, my viewpoint on this, I definitely agree with Antonin and Adrien's critique, is that there is no money creation because there is no money, actually. Or there is no way to highlight the existence of money in this model. So we have already rewritten a new model where you see money creation. The unique, so I definitely agree with that. Uh, the unique point where I disagree with uh, Antonin and Adrien, but it's not it's a minor point, is that they write in the paper, probably we have to give away sales law and to, yeah. to allow for inventories in order to have money creation. And I'm on the side of Mateus Caselli, this guy, because I have a paper where I show how to introduce money endogenous non-neutral money creation, even without breaking sales law. In addition to that, we have to break sales law, but not in order to let money appear in the model. So I essentially agree with all this. Okay, thank you. So okay. we are driven away from the King's model. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Even the way Steve has written debt has to be rewritten if you want to allow money creation to be uh, in the model. Mm. Very interesting. I think the next question we might also have a lot of convergence. Uh, because one of the other things we missed in the model was uh, the role of the state. Of course, by simplification, there's an exclusion of the public sector, which has uh, some implications. We only have private investment and consumption, and, there's, and the financing of corporate debt all comes from household debt. Um, and in the paper, it's claimed uh, this comes from the vulnerability of the public finances then in 2018. And you talk today in the lecture about how public debt doesn't matter, which we were happy to hear. Um, and then we want to ask you what's your position on this. After the COVID-19 crisis, we saw we could have a much greater fiscal expansion, but at the same time, we have higher debt. Um, so do you think also uh, there is role for the state in this transition in terms of public investment and, and lending? Oh, yeah. So my answer to the question is getting... So if you look at the report of the Rousseau Institute, what we have said is that the, the state for France should spend something like 30 billion um, euros uh, every year in order to fund green investment. We also know that at the world level, and this is a figure which is given by Nick Stern in the new climate economy report, we need in order to remain close to the two degree target, we need like 90 trillion dollars of green investment at the world level before 2035. And it's clear that it's not the private sector who is going, which is going to spend this money. So we definitely need to the state to enter the picture. And so I'm not saying that the public debt doesn't matter. I'm just saying that <coughs> between two calamities, you have to choose the, the lesser one. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's better to have an increase of public debt but to save people than to have everybody dying while you decrease your public debt. Okay? Yeah. You may know that actually now today, uh, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, you have 20 countries which are bargaining a reduction of the public debt because they are unfortunately already entering again in the vicious circle of a huge increase of the public debt, mm -hmm. not just because of the World Bank and the, I and the AFD, but also because of the CDB, the China Development Bank, which is providing a lot of money, but then this increases tremendously in public debt in these Sub-Saharan uh, African countries. So what they are suggesting today is that we should organize a swap of a debt swap for climate, which I believe is a very good idea, 
So what does it mean? It means that you reduce the debt, so the creditor gives a part of the debt, part of you know the liability that he has on the on the on the debtor, but then the debtor promises to use the, the degrees of maneuver that he or she gains in order to invest into green investment. So that the swap of debt for climate. South Africa is implementing it today, and you have 20 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa which are trying to do the same. And I'm sure that if we were clever enough, we should do the same in the Eurozone. We can do it. We should just cancel the public debt, which is held by the Central Bank of Europe in its balance sheet, again, against the promise by the members of the Eurozone that they would invest money for green infrastructures. This would just be a swap, of, swap for debt. The World Bank has implemented thousands of debt swap for climate in the early 2000s. I don't see why we could not do it. So this is also an argument to say public debt really, I'm not saying it doesn't matter, but public debt is not the primary problem in the whole story. Yeah. I would have loved to, to, to see you against uh, Lavois because yesterday she just shown us how because the, the, the price of uh, this operation in terms of flow doesn't change anything. He explained us everything. But still, I'm still skeptical about his argument, so we won't go th into this. We wanted to talk about this, but it needs a long demonstration, and we are a bit in a rush, so we, 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 yeah. we will just <coughs> like skip this. Just I have a question, because you said that it's important to have a stock flow consistent model. But if we, if we take again the goodwill model, um, the relation between the monet monetary sphere and the real sphere is not stock for consistent because the consumption in monetary sphere is pending patterns from deposit accounts and consumption in real spheres is what is left when investment has been made. Uh, so basically, if we took the both, it's not stock for it's not equal. It, this has to be. So it's an inc inconsistency. Yeah. So this time I don't agree with that because there is no such thing as a monetary sphere in the good demand. Yeah. Actually, and I'm, on this I agree with Antonin and Adrien, which is to say there is no money in this money. It's a real economy. Now, just so that's my answer to this. Now, they have another critique, yeah, which is very we, interesting. We go because we have but I'm day. just going to answer to you on this, yeah. even though you don't have time to, <laughs> have to say it. And I agree <laughs> with them, which is that they say, you know, the, the, the collapse of the economy, that is the convergence towards the bad equilibrium, is not Minskian instability. Yes. And I agree with them. But the point is just, this is just due to the fact that you have debt which increases to infinity. Yeah. So we have, we have also endogenized uh, 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 a cap on debt which is given by capital. So if you introduce some collateral, so capital is the collateral of debt, and you introduce endogenous default, then you have a truly Minskian convergence towards a, a, yeah, a, but how did you a bad equilibrium. The, the basin of attraction is... is, is, is the basin of attraction is smaller, yes. Yeah. So, but how do you know that? This. No, 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 they haven't run that. They, they, they haven't run a model with default. We have done it, they haven't. So let's give the room for the last very interesting debate. All right, <laughs> so now we will push the discussion a bit farther. Uh, we're going to go away from math and we're going to discuss <laughs> economics. <laughs> and uh, for that, I would like to start with a short story. Uh, there is a guy at the subway, he lost his keys. Okay, he's trying to find them. Here there's light, so he's trying to find them. He can't find them. Someone else comes and tries to help. Hey, what's happening? Yes, I lost my keys. Okay, m let me help you. They keep finding, and no, they don't find the keys. So the second person tells to the first person, are you sure you lost them here? And the first person goes, no, I actually lost them there, but there is dark. So I'm looking here because here is light. And that's math. Math <laughs> brings a lot of light, sheds a lot of light on reality, but circumscribed to some very specific aspects for which I would like to elaborate the uh, discussion from evolutionary economics um, posed by Joriescu Rogan in the 70s and others farther up, and even Schumpeter before, uh, under a different framework. So basically, Joriescu says that there are two types of concepts. One of them, which are the arithmomorphic, which are those who are like very defined and clearly circumscribed, basically real numbers or regular geometric forms. But then you also have the dialectic uh, concepts, which are those, in his words, bounded, surrounded by penumbras in which their meaning overlaps with that of their opposites. So long story short, things that cannot be clearly defined because they will mean one thing in one place and the opposite in another place. And those are most of the concepts that we are uh, surrounded by, from consciousness, trust, and knowledge to the concept of good, of justice, and particularly the notions of utility and welfare. What Yoriescu argues is that uh, qualitative concepts and qualitative change cannot be explained 
by arithmomorphic concepts, because by definition, these dialectic concepts are not clearly defined. And therefore, if we think about evolution of a qualitative change process, we cannot express evolution in arithmomorphic uh, terms. And even further, if we think about the economic process as an evolutionary process, then math is by no way, by definition, able to express fully the economic process. So uh, what I would like to pose here is more like an open question about the relevance of math in economics. Uh, you presented a very complex model. It's, I think, a very good evolution to quote myself in the economic thought to go away from neoclassical assumptions to try to fit reality into the model, but we're still modeling and we're still trying to put concepts that are like not clearly defined by math and to try to explain uh, reality by them. So there are two questions basically. What is your opinion on the mathematization of economics and therefore the mathematization of social life and, um, yeah, social life? And the second one, which will introduce the following topic, is considering the current state of affairs and how disconnected science and public policy are. Policy makers disregard science. Most, many of them actually blame on science and argue against science. Do you think that is a good approach to complexify more the explanation of reality to make policy makers actually take initiative and do some change? So, yeah, thank you. That's a very good debate. Which is both a political debate and an epistemological debate. So, my viewpoint is that we need maps to orient ourselves. Every map is wrong, like every model, but some maps are useful. So, I would not throw, you know, throw out the, the, the baby with the water of the bath. Mm -hmm. My viewpoint is to say, when I discuss with uh, political leaders, as I did when I was at the French Development Bank, talking with head of sta heads of states, prime ministers, governments, etc. They need toolkits to understand what would be the consequences of this or that policy, public policy. Otherwise, they are completely blind. So the, of course, the error is to believe that the kind of prospective scenarios that we can run with our models should describe the whole reality of what's going to happen. That's not true. But you have no model, it's just to make decisions in complete blindness. And now to tell you the truth, my experience is that these people, when they have to make a decision, they listen a little bit to the modelers and essentially listen also to many other people who are talking to them, which involve, you know, I mean, political struggle, as you would suggest, you know, sociological problems, etc., etc. So the modeling aspect is just one aspect of the question and it's certainly not the, the unique one. So, and this would be a big mistake to base my public decision only on the model and I completely agree with that. But it would also be a, a mistake, I believe, to just give up any model, because let's, let me just give you an example. When the Central Bank of Europe today is, decides to increase interest rate, its interest rate, it's a quantitative problem. By how much do you increase it? If you believe you have to increase it. Is it 1.5, 1.75, 1.25? And you cannot just discuss this you know, with your roommate and say, hey, what do you think? You know? So you also, have, you also need a model to help you understand what the consequences would be if you choose 0.25 rather than 0.5. Now, there is another epistemological problem that you are raising, which is the status of mathematics, which is a much deeper problem. My viewpoint is that there is no such thing as a clear definition in mathematics. Mathematics is a language which needs also to be interpreted. So we need a hermeneutics of mathematics. Mathematics is not a transparent universal language as would have been dreamed by someone, I don't know whether you know this guy, Gottfried Leibniz, mm -hmm. you know, a big German philosopher of the 18th century, who was dreaming of the, what he called Mathematica Universalis in Latin, which is a kind of language that would be understood by everybody without any interpretation, because it would be universal and the truth, something like that. You know? This language does not exist for one very important reason that I mentioned in my last book, that you all have all thought already, <laughs> uh, which is the so-called Gödel theorem, you know, in the 30s. Mm -hmm. Kurt Gödel was a gigantic uh, logician from Denmark, and what he proved is that even for the simplest mathematics, which is called the zermelo frankel axiomatics, you have incompleteness of this language. What does it mean? It means that it is possible 
even for the simplest kind of mathematics you can think of, to write sentences in this language right. of which you cannot and you will need to prove whether this sentence is true or not. So which means mathematical language is intrinsically incomplete. So there is space for interpretation, even in mathematics. So once you have understood that, you say, OK, I need some models. I know that my models need to be interpreted. And I'm not just you know, considering these models as being the truth given by God, because it's not the case. I have a work to be done, which is hermeti hermeneutical work in the interpretation of the model within a context which is historically dependent, etc., etc. Perfect. Yes, that was addressed actually by Hansel 2013. Um, so even if assuming, which is not what you're saying, that math would be a perfect language, we would still need to translate it to our own language, English in this case, the one we're using, but our own also other languages. And that process is going to have its own complications. And that leads us to the second um, critique or, or discussion debate, which is about the use of a global policy perspective. So uh, what I want to argue here um, is that, uh, first of all, uh, by pushing for a global tackle of climate change and a global model of how to address climate change, we think that what we are doing is we are assuming that there is a model that can be applied uniformly all over the world. And by doing so, we are somehow uh, neglecting the spa spatial dimension of capitalism. Capitalism is not the same in Europe as it is in Uruguay or South Africa. Because capitalism, with its imperialist facet, it has different implications from people in different parts of the world and throughout history. Therefore, pushing for a global perspective, which is needed because there is only one planet and we all live in the same planet, would in somehow under this green growth perspective of let's do this and let's do that in order to maintain growth in the long run in 2100, deepen actually capitalism as the uniformous and homogeneous way of understanding the way the economy works and understanding the way the economy can be improved and we can prevent the catastrophe, wiping out some nuances that can be taken into consideration and some other ways of organizing life and also other ways of organizing society and the economy in general. And on another thing, um, Woodward and Sims pose this thing that, okay, in order to uh, eliminate global poverty, we need to give more to the poor, but the cake cannot grow anymore. Because if we want to grow the cake, either we go to destruction, as the model predicts, or we, uh, so new forms of redistribution, we grow the cake and redistribute, or we shift to alternative economic pathways. But this assumption of the global model and the global way of tackling things, I think, neglects a bit the shift to economic alternative economic pathway. So I would like to discuss a bit of that, you know, like how, yeah, it, I'm, I'm, I'm done. It's just yeah, like how, no, how sorry. Yeah. more like a philosophical question, okay? It's like, okay, yes, things need to be done at the global scale, but pushing for one way of doing things, like, for example, carbon a global tax. carbon tax or uh, the trading system or the debt change, as you were mentioning, mm -hmm. it's homogenizing in a sure. way. So how so do we address this in a like, more multicultural, multi-dimensional sure. perspective? So as uh, you probably know the work, the beautiful work done by Bruno Amable on this, you know, where I use a variety of capitalisms, also by, by Robert Boyer, big guy, who deserves to be much better known than he is today in France. So I definitely agree with that. And the answer to this, which is the same as the answer to that, is that we are now working on models for nations, for countries. So the model we are going to, to build for South Africa will not be the same as the model for Benin or for Bolivia or for Chile. And this will include the nitty gritty of the institutional specifics of each country. And definitely we are not making, the, we are definitely not going to make the assumption that capitalism in South Africa, which is essentially racist, is the same as capitalism in Bolivia. You know? So one answer to this is we are going to specialize all our models in so far we are going to work with countries. And now on green growth, I have very little to say on that because I don't believe that GDP is a right interesting indicator of anything. So I'm asked this question every second day and my answer is always the same. Who cares? You know, going green might create a lot of new jobs. This will increase GDP. Might also destroy a lot of sources of profit. 
for a number of fossil fuel based activities and this will reduce GDP. At the end of the day, whether the first phenomenon or the second one will, will, will win the battle, I don't know. And actually I don't care. What matters is you know, education, health, life expectancy, these kind of questions, inequality, and this is not GDP. So we should not even bother about green growth. It's a trap invented by neoclassical economists to say, hey, you want to live like an Amish, you know? Very bad idea. I'm a progressist guy, you know, from, the, from enlightenment, and I want green growth. That's just a political trap. Okay. I have a follow-up question, and then we can open the floor. Yeah, yeah because uh, there are only 10 minutes left. Yeah, okay, so, so uh, I suggest that we have no more than three okay. questions, and go okay. straight to the point, please. So th this thing you're saying about like no, taking into consideration no, the... I know. Uh, we, we need to open oh, okay. to uh, the only 10 we minutes left. Uh, uh, we collect few questions uh, perhaps. Uh, 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 SLG3, uh, uh, no? Pop, pop, pop. Okay, please. Simeon? And not only men. Yes. One. So ladies. Ladies, you. Two. And so Three. Yeah, okay. So I have a question coming to the green transition. Since uh, most of the green energies, so wind power, solar panels, they are intermittent energies. So at the same time, for example, Germany did its green transition with the rise of coal, with the rise of gas. So it's impossible actually to have a completely clean uh, green energy. So my question is, is it possible like doing like a real green transition without sacri sacrificing too much growth? Without sacrificing too much growth? Yeah, yeah. <coughs> Again, I don't know. GDP <laughs> growth is no longer, should no longer be a problem. No longer be a target for public policy. We, should, we definitely should not care about that. If you were to ask without reducing life expectancy, education, health, etc., I would say I hope it's possible. And for instance, for France, the, the transition uh, scenario that we have suggested seems to increase, to, to even uh, improve the situation for everybody in France. So just on a, on a monetary side, this would provide 1,500 euros more per household per year because they would reduce the spending in terms of energy, in terms of the health system, etc., etc., because you would have much less pollution, less cancer, etc., etc. So, so this is just a monetary side. We haven't studied in full, uh, in full depth, you know, the impact in terms of life expectancy and these kind of questions. But I do believe, I hope it's possible, otherwise, you know, it would be very dramatic. At the same time, we know that today life expectancy, even in France, for a number of people is reducing. You have people today in France who are starving. So the future is, does not look good for them unless we implement the energy transition. Yeah, question over there? Um, yeah, I was curious whether your model is focusing specifically on carbon emissions or whether you're considering all planetary boundaries. So are you taking into consideration the material? flows and stops that are uh, needed for this kind of transition and also um, are you including various elements of social justice so when you're saying you're interested in sort of the inequalities and stuff are you also inputting these into the models and if not I guess won't that just surely lead to another situation that's surely not better for anybody else and just a continuation of capital. So that's a very good question so on the first side of your question the answer is yes but it's not yet published so we are working on the coupling of this kind of microeconomic model with a geophysical model, which would provide you with information like if we have plus 1% of the increase of you know, the GDP in China, what would be the impact in terms of lithium, so greenhouse gas emissions obviously, but also wood, you know, timber, et cetera, et cetera. So for that purpose, we need geophysicists to help us. Uh, my friend Jean Covici tries to do it, but it's not completely satisfactory. We have the model and we are coupling it with the microeconomic model. So maybe hopefully in one year I will be able to come back and to show you these results. Now on the second aspect, which is uh, you know, fairness and justice and inequality. So there is an inequality side of this model, which is a paper I have published with Matteus Caselli, the guy whose name was written here, which shows that if you have too much inequalities in terms of income, just income, then you drive the economy towards the bad equilibrium. And to the best of my knowledge, it's the first formal link between inequality and growth. It's not a plea in favor of growth, but it's a way to understand the size of the cake depends upon the way you distribute the cake. And as you know, this was a big mantra of neoclassical economists who would say, no, there is no relationship between both. So we have a formal proof within this kind of family of models that there is a link between both. And if you want to just stabilize GDP, you should reduce inequality. Now, to go further, because income inequality is not enough, 
we have to take into account the gender inequality, you know, uh, racial inequality, etc., etc. Then again, it's it's not a way to evade the question. But I cannot do this unless I'm focusing on a country or region, because the question of inequalities in South Africa, to take this example, which has de which are deeply linked to you know the apartheid, which even after 1994 is still in force in South Africa, as you probably know, then it's a completely different picture from inequality in Italy. You know, it's a different question. So my viewpoint is that we should not try to have an all-embracing understanding of fairness, a la Rawls, you know, which is very abstract, but country by country, looking at the nitty-gritty, the history of the society of this country, understanding where are the places where people are suffering from injustice and how can we deal with that. Oh, that's another big question. For the timing, I'm not able to do that. <laughs> maybe one day, maybe in two years, three years. But nobody is doing what you suggest. It's very important. I agree with you. And perhaps it's maybe a broader critique that they were making of these ideas of modeling something that is ultimately so complex that a model will never be able to capture the radical uncertainties. I see radicalism. your point. You could say, well, the reality is so complex. I, I just prefer to be blind than having a map. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> My answer is that. No, not necessarily. <laughs> Try to go in the mountain with a map or without a map. You're happy to have a map. And every map is false. Some maps are useful. Okay, and the last question. Yeah. Sophie? Uh, my question is on the modeling a bit. And mm -hmm. I wondered, uh, you say it's a complex model, but in the end it is also with uh, analytical equations and resolutions of sure. equations. So I wondered what would happen if you added the role of randomness and if you added some elements that would be more stochastic and then what would that, uh, how would that affect the dynamics and the equilibria in the model? So we have done it. So there is a, a follow-up of the paper Coping with Collapse where we have added some randomness on labor productivity, on the climate sensitivity, and also on the capacity of oceans to absorb greenhouse gas emissions because this is also a variable that is not deterministic. And then essentially it gives you the same kind of qualitative picture, except that you, re you replace every simulation by a Monte Carlo simulation. And instead of having one, just one path, <coughs> can, I, can I just, yep. excuse me. Instead of having just one path like this, you have you know, a neighborhood surrounding the path where you say this is the median of the trajectory and there is 95 or 95% yeah, chance that the tr true trajectory will be within this neighborhood. You know, as we do in finance, it's ex exactly the same. My viewpoint is Thank that it is, uh, it is sexy, you know, fancy, but doesn't add a lot of added value in terms of science. We know how to do it, we can do it. I will do it probably just to make it fancier for, you know, policy makers. <laughs> but to be honest, I don't think that's the crux of the, the problem. You see what I mean? Yeah. Two minutes. Pardon? While uh, yeah, you still have a chance to ask a question, uh, uh, Gail just published that book. Unfortunately, it's in French, and it's based on his PhD in, in uh, theology. theology. In theology, and it's also about commons that you, you hear a lot about commons here in Benjamin Korea, but it's uh, it's the central topic of the theology. Yeah, the main idea is to say we have to promote commoning and the commons at the regional, national, international level in order to deal with the production of highly important resources like health, health sorry, biodiversity, oceans, you know, fishes, um, water, <coughs> etc. Et <coughs> and so it's a, it's a meditation about the political and the theological policy of this. So we can thank you because you, you did not even give a speech at Paris School of Economics and you came for...